normal right before my alarm was to go off. You know, I said, you know, I'm feeling really good today. Uh, but then I had to get up out of bed. And I, <laughs> so I stumbled in to take a shower and get, get ready to go. And I took my glasses off because, you know, going into the shower. And you know how close the word conditioner and the word shampoo looks when you don't have your glasses on? <laughs> well, so I got, you know, I thought I was doing shampoo and I'm getting a whole head. So I just wonder if you think my hair is really nice and fluffy and manageable today. I got a whole bottle of conditioner on my head and uh, I don't think the shampoo could get it out. I tried two or three times to get it out. And uh, so now I'm wondering, does too much conditioner make your hair fall out? Because, uh, well, that's just the way I think. So, you know, we'll, we'll go from that. Let's take our Bibles, if you will, and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy and uh, chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for uh, an opportunity to study and fellowship with those of like precious faith. We pray as we bring our minds and our thoughts together on this word that together we will exalt your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. It's truly uh, amazing to me, uh, a a verse, just two verses here, which uh, really appear... Uh, and it's a passage uh, designed by God to be encouraging, to, to teach us security, to give us confidence in His Word, that a passage which is so direct, and uh, in a lot of ways you would think it would be benign, but we know that at least in my lifetime it is called some of the most division and viciousness where there have been churches who have separated one from another, where there have been a family who have separated one from another. Organizations have been divided uh, one from another. Family has been divided one from another. Over the simple, a simple issue of God's Word, what can we expect from God? Where is it and is it possible today for people to be able to stand and hold with confidence that they have God's Word without error in their hand? That's been a vicious cycle. And like I say, probably one of the most hotly contested uh, topics and doctrines of, of my lifetime. But all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And uh, as we look about today, we recognize how many people have you ever run into that really had problems with verse, the first part of verse 16? You know, not many people. Oh, there's some people who want to get upset perhaps over, well, it, what, is it really mechanical dictation? Did God actually cause the words to to be written down? But the Scriptures are pretty clear. All Scripture is given, and that's also past tense, by the way, by inspiration of God and is profitable. And the things that the Scriptures are profitable for are for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in, in righteousness, for this one singular purpose, that the man of God may be perfect, Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If there is one thing of which we feel anyway in uh, uh, lack sufficiency to go about and to be involved in good works, you know what we need to recognize and to do? It is because we fail to have a proper relationship with the Scriptures because this is exactly what God has designed for it to do. In simplicity, in straightforwardness, as we come to God's Word and we see all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I like the fact that it's just God breathed. You know, you know the things that God uh, breathed life into. You know, way back in the book of Genesis, that God breathed breath into into man, and man became a living soul. And that soul will live somewhere for eternity. And when God spoke the words of His Bible into existence, the Scriptures into existence, they became designed to live somewhere forever. And that's God's purpose. When God gave us the Scriptures, He was communicating His thoughts, His ideas, 
and his principles. And God did this by using words. And part of the reason why, I think, is because that's the way we understand. We understand and communicate in words and synthesis and, and, and information. And how important are those words, though? How important, and we would say, are they important enough to say that it's very possible that someone's eternal life will depend on those very words? You know, when we come to a passage of Scripture that says, uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the... Uh, no, is that verse 23? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Can you believe one part of that verse would be true, but the other part would be untrue? Can we have confidence in one side of that in the first half of that verse versus the other half? And we come along and says, for the wages of sin is death. And that's going to apply to everyone who is, falls into the classification of being a sinner. It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 says, there is none righteous, no, not one. Because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We come and we take a look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. But it says, for he, that's God, hath made him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Paul says, For I declared unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. You know what? I like every one of those verses. But every one of those verses are true, whether I like them or not. Every one of those verses are true because this is what God's Word has to say. And I don't have to spend even one minute of time trying to say, trying to figure out, is this really what God meant? Have we really captured His thoughts, His words, His meaning? Or is it just somehow His, his, uh, his intent or somewhere along the line? Because if I'm going to say, is this just God's intent? If God, is this really important? Who actually then becomes the authority? I become the authority because all of a sudden I'm over here saying this is important or that's important and this isn't as important. There are those people who believe that what God preserved were the essential doctrines of, of the Word. And so, you know, I'm thinking, well, which doctrine isn't essential? If God thought it enough about it, to put it down and preserve it and say, I got an accurate, reliable copy of it for you, which one of those would we say, God, our opinion was, that's insignificant. I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to come out and put myself to be some sort of an authority in that way and question what God thought to be important versus what I think to be important. The same thing, the safe thing to do is just say, we have confidence in what God says. So we know we do recognize, and uh, we recognize that without the ability to have access to a, an accurate, reliable, written copy of God's Word today, then whether God spoke them or not would be irrelevant. But because we do have, and because God has set forth a plan and a purpose in his Bible, and this plan is identifiable, and it comes based on the words that God breathed into existence and caused men to write down, we can come back away from that and we can say, all right, now God had a plan for the words that he spoke. The doctrine of inspiration is certainly important, but really the most debated doctrine of Scripture today is the doctrine of preservation. Did God preserve his word? I think we could say, yes, he preserved his word. And you know why I know that God preserved his word? Because I read it in the book that he wrote. He preserved his word. He breathed his word. He caused it to come into existence. And then he preserves his word. So the doctrines of preservation are clear. Come to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. 
For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And I'm glad that they did. I'm glad that God took, took, uh, took charge of the process of inspiration. I'm glad that when God spoke, that he caused men to write it down so that they would write down the very words that he spoke. No prophecy is in any private interpretation. There was not one prophet that when God was, was speaking and having him write down the words that God was speaking, that he used his own private interpretation or understanding of what he thought those words meant. God took control of that situation and he caused the words to be, to be, uh, to be written down. And what did holy men of God uh, do as they spake? <laughs> holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And they spake the words that God wanted them to write. And then in the process of time, they were written down. Come with me to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. Then of the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in, in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with you. I am with, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. That's a great, that's a great uh, plan and understanding. You know, when Jeremiah then was speaking in, in light of who he was, a prophet of God, what was he speaking? The words that God wanted him to speak because he put his hand on his mouth and what came out of Jeremiah's mouth were the words that God would have said had he been standing right in front of them. That's how powerful the doctrine of inspiration is. So why would God be so careful? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God puts his hand on the mouth of Jeremiah so that he would speak. Why would he be so careful about that? Because God has designed today that when we come into contact with his written word, we literally come into contact with God himself. And that is... A tremendous promise we do. And how does God feel about his word? Talk about feelings and emotion. I think God's pretty emotional about his word and what, uh, what happens to his word. Come to Psalm chapter 138. Psalm chapter 138. And sometimes I think it's okay if we get a little passionate about the Word of God. And I didn't say mean. I didn't say, you know, antagonistic. I just said passionate about this because this is important. How could it be, how could it be something that would be not right for us to have the same opinion about God's Word that God has Himself? Psalm chapter 138, verses 1 and 2. I will praise thee with my whole heart before the God's will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name as encompassing and limitless as God's name is. God says, my word is more than that. It's above that. I would stake my word above the very reputation of what my name means. Well, that's pretty, that's pretty important, isn't it? He's taking a pretty high standard of what he believes about, about his word. So from this, we know that God has more than inspiration in mind. Do you think that when God spoke his word, when God had, caused it to be written down, he was just going to forget about it? He was just going to say, oh, I'll just leave it up to man. To, uh, to take care of it, I'm sure it'll be okay. 
No, I think he, he, he understood that. God intended that his words would be preserved for eternity. And the very doctrine of preservation is so important. Today, once again, little debate over inspiration, but there is a, a fierce battle that still rages today over preservation. Did God preserve his word? If so, where did he preserve it? And is it possible that believers can come along in the sea of all the Bibles that are available out there? Can they come and can people come, can believers come and identify where it's at? That's going to be the challenge for believers today. So if you were wanting to go and to answer the question about where can God's word be found, where do you think you could go? Could you go online and study and come up with some, uh, some ideas? Yeah, you're like a 16 for and 37 against. I mean, you can just get all kinds of opinions on uh, of what people think on the Internet. We could go into a bookstore, Christian bookstore, and we could look around and we could see there. We could always ask our friends and our family. Or we could go into some denominational place and we could ask them what they believe about it, and it would be hit and miss as to if you would get good advice or not. Where's the best place to go? And the best place for us to go would be to look for the internal evidence of where God's Word is. Look internally to see what God has said and see if there is a way that He has laid out that we can identify how to come up with the answer about how we can find God's Word. A faithful study of God's Word will teach us what God planned for His Word. Come to Psalm chapter 12. Psalm chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. Psalm chapter 12. Psalm chapter 12, verse 6 and 7 says, The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. It's perpetual. The time will never run out. This does not have an expiration date. Now, I have seen all kinds of things done with these two verses. Now, it says the words of the Lord are pure words. And so people will say, well, he's not talking about the Bible here. He's talking about the nation of Israel. Well, you know, the words of the Lord are pure. As, and, uh, as a trite in a furnace of fire, purified seven of times, thou. He's talking about the Lord. He says, thou shalt preserve them. Because if God didn't preserve his word, it wouldn't be any good for the nation of Israel if they didn't have access to what God wanted them to do. And they have a plan. And God has told them about the preservation of the nation of Israel. they got plenty of information there as they go through it. You know, we come along and we we remember. And we think about everything. We see then we can read all the verses in the Psalms and everything that the psalmist thought about the nature and the character of God and his veracity and ability to preserve his word. We come into Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18. How significant is anything and everything that God has put in his word? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Isn't that great? I was talking with someone some years ago now, going through some of these same verses and the same principles that we, were, we would be going along with and through here. And we would we'd take a look, and, and he just said, finally, he says, I get so tired of you guys. Can't you all come up with something new, some different verses? Yeah. So maybe you hadn't noticed it, but inspiration ceased. <laughs> there are no more verses. What's wrong with these? However, how many different ways would God have to say it for you to believe it? And the point is, God said that he would preserve. Not one jot nor one tittle would in any wise pass from the law till it all be fulfilled. He's going to preserve his word forever. 
And so we come along and say, did we need to really say it any different? But in these, these three verses, we can see and we can understand. And I said, him, said to him, as I've said to many people over the years now, that we're, it, where we need to go is inside. The internal evidence is irrefutable if we believe what God has to say about his word. Irrefutable evidence. And, uh, and so we do. And why is, it, why is it important? It's so that men like Paul could come along and he could, he could go on his missionary journeys and he could go from town to town. He could go from synagogue to synagogue. He could go into Thessalonica and he could go up to Berea and he could come along and he could see and he would use and preach first that Jesus was the Christ. And what would he use? He would use copies, his copy of what he had access to uh, for the Old Testament. And what could the Thessalonians do or what could the Bereans do? They could take what the Apostle Paul had to say and compare what he had to say with their copies. And then they could see whether or not they would pass the test of a true Berean. Come to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. So Paul could have it in his day. The Bereans could have it in their day. We can have it in our day because of God's promise. Acts chapter 17, verses 10 and 11. And uh, and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming hither went into the synagogue of the Jews. And these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. What should we do? I mean, it's okay if someone were to come to you and say, listen, I've got some evidence I want you to look at. You know, we, we, we probably would have our minds made up, but we would want to receive it and to be, have a readiness of mind to go and to see if these things were so. Now, if these things were so, where? In the copy of God's word that they had when Paul was there. What made the Bereans? more noble than those in Thessalonica, is that they received the word with all readiness of mind? No. It's that they searched the scriptures to see whether those things were so or not. They went to the source. They went to the internal evidence to find out whether what Paul was saying was about the Lord Jesus Christ was true or not. You know, I've been told by more than one person that the doctrine of preservation, as we believe it, is just a figment of our imagination. I said, well, you know, I do have an active imagination. (laughs) And sometimes it gets me in trouble because I believe everybody's thinking the same thing that I'm thinking. And then come to find out they don't know what I'm thinking, so it makes a little sense what my imagination is coming up with. But is it a figment of our imagination? Is there any evidence? Is there any truth that we can come up with that we can substantiate our findings with? And what they were asking really is this. Do you have any scholars that agree with you? Now, I look back here and I say, Brother Perry Lemons, Brother Carl Hayes, come on down. I've always wanted to say that, but I don't come down. But let me ask you. Are you, do you consider yourself to be a Bible scholar? Pastor Jordan, do you consider yourself to be a Bible scholar? You know, I would suspect that the answer is no. You know what we, we believe ourselves to be? Students. We believe that we're students. And when we come to the Word with all readiness of mind and search the Scriptures daily, whether these things be so or not, then the Holy Spirit is exactly where He needs to be with the heart that is ready to receive His teaching about what's going on. And so we can come and we can have this confidence in God's Word that as a student who has confidence in God's Word that the Holy Spirit then will be able to teach us. So we're not scholars, we're, we're, we're teachers. and I mean, we're students, and the Holy Spirit is our teacher. So we come along, and we come up, you know, some questions are good, and I have a couple of questions that I've developed over the years, and I found this to be on point. I ask, where were you, and who were you with when you came to believe that you could not trust your old King James Bible? 
You didn't get that from the Holy Spirit. You did not get that from the internal evidence of God's Word. You got that from some man who had elevated himself in his opinion and was forcing that uh, elevated under, uh, opinion of himself onto someone else, and they became the scholar, and they would say, you cannot trust your Bible, and here's why. And so ultimately, who became the authority? In that case, not the Holy Spirit. You know who becomes the authority? The person who's telling you why you can't trust your Bible. And so we come and we put this in. And so, you know, because I understood as a child, now I didn't know anything about the, the, the Bible issues until um, I started grade school of the Bible. And we began to learn and to understand about some things. But what I did know was as a child... I instinctively believed that my Bible was trustworthy. I didn't have to wonder if it was. I believed that it was. So we come along and we see, and the answer to everything that we come about is what? What saith the Scriptures? And does God have a plan? And is there any internal evidence of what that plan is? And we say, absolutely. Come to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17 and verse 14. God has an absolutely foolproof plan of what he wants to happen to his word. Exodus chapter 17 and verse 14 and the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out this remembrance from uh, remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You know the only reason why we know anything about Amalek? Because God's Word reminds us about Amalek. But if you look into history, we would not know anything about them because they were utterly destroyed. That's they are destroyed so much that there is no evidence that they even existed. And if it wasn't for God's word, they wouldn't even they wouldn't even have a place in history at, at all. So we come along and he says to Moses, write it in a book. Why? Because I want there to be a testimony. I want there to be a memorial of what I have to say about the nation of, of Israel. And so Moses wrote, and he continued to write and add to the book that God uh, was breathing and God was uh, causing uh, um, Moses to write. And he wrote all the way up until his part of God's word was finished. And then it's turned over to, uh, to Joshua. Come with me, if you will, to Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. And it becomes Joshua's responsibility, if you will, to pick up where Moses left off with the book and, and add. Uh, Joshua chapter 24, verses 25 and 26. Joshua chapter 24, verses 25 and 26. He says, So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and then a statute and an ordinance uh, in, in a Shechem, and Joshua wrote these words of the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up under an oak that was by the sanctuary uh, of the Lord. So Joshua takes and he begins his own little thing about writing in stone. And he comes along and he, he puts this. And what's the idea about stone? Man, that's something that's going to last. That's something that's going to be there. And it's going to be a witness and a testimony and a memorial against the nation of Israel. And what was it going to be? It was going to be all about blessing and judgment based on the physical blessings if they, if they responded and kept God's word or the judgment, the physical judgment that would come if they did not remember to remain faithful. After Joshua became Samuel's time. And next would, would come the, the record of the kings. And next, the, uh, and a little more information in First and Second Chronicles. All about what God was going to do as men added to his book. There was a no wrinkle, though, when it came into the kings. 
What God wanted was the kings to start, and we began to identify what God's real purpose for preservation was going to be. It starts out with a book that he breathed, that he calls to be written down, and now he wants men to make copies of it. And he told the kings, he says to the kings, he says, I want you to have your own copy. And so we see that the copies begin to be made, and they begin to take and to make the copies. And uh, one of the great copies, one of the great uh, contentions of men copying God's Word is can they also be reliable? Well, would would they in any way be suspect to human error? But you know, God didn't say that he he wasn't going to, that he was going to protect and say there would never be a copyist there. Well, we get to learn from God's Word. It's through the multiplicity of copies. It's through the abundance of evidence. It's through that. Then men can read and they can come along and they can say, well, that differs from that and let's find out why. They could find another witness. They could find another testimony. And through the multiplicity of copies, they can come and they begin uh, to, to set right. And it's not just what seems right unto man. See, that doesn't seem right unto man. It doesn't seem right unto man that God would turn his Bible loose and just let man become responsible for it. But he didn't. <laughs> he, he says, you know, let's begin to make copies so that we can compare. You think there's ever, ever, ever been a copyist error? Absolutely. Was it possible to identify where the mistake was in that copy? Copy? Absolutely. And so we would come along and we would do. But, you know, the answer to all of this was God is going to give us a design and a procedure which absolutely guarantees the accuracy of, of, uh, of the Bible through the book that he calls to be written down, through the copies that, that are going to be made. And the first lesson that we learn is that we're going to learn, if you will, that God had absolutely, he was not going to preserve his word through the original. And I used to think about that and say, well, that's a strange thing. Why not preserve the original? But we learn from the very first time when Moses comes down off of Mount Sinai. And as he's coming down, he's been up there 40 days and 40 nights. And as he comes down, he begins to hear. He says, you know, I'm hearing something kind of weird in the camp down there. It's not that of triumph. No one has come and overtaken us and defeated us. Or no one's come in and we've defeated them. And he come to find out that within the four, first 40 days that he had been gone, the people, the nation that he brought out of, the na- uh, out of the land of Egypt had turned to idolatry. And they were worshiping a calf. And they were all running around naked all around this calf. And, uh, and Moses sees that. And the anger of Moses begins to get what? Well, and his steam's coming out his nose and out of his ears and his face is turning all red and Moses became so angry he takes the words that he wrote that God wrote on a tablet and he throws them down and they did exactly what stones would do when you did that they broke read the rest of the story and that's no problem We know that if God, his intention was to uh, preserve his word through the originals, there would have not been anything. Moses couldn't get angry enough to to destroy God's word. He could throw them down. He could jump on them. He could go get the chariot and run over it three or four times. He could do all sorts of things. There wouldn't be anything that he could do to destroy his word, God's word. They broke. God says, no problem. We'll just write another one. We'll make a copy of the original. Then you have, in Jeremiah's time, King Jehudi. And here's King Jehudi. He's in, the, he's in his winter, uh, the king and, and Jehudi, his servant. And they're in the winter house. And there's a fire burning in the hearth. And Jeremiah sends down that which he had written. And Jehudi rehearses it into the ears of the king. And the king just did not like what he heard. So he says, you know, I've got a really nice knife. Let me cut these leaves. Let me cut these in pieces and throw them in a fire. Well, now, if the originals were what was important, guess what? His knife would not have been sharp enough. And he could have cut and he could have tried and he could have done that until he got so mad they just took the whole scroll and threw it into the fire. 
And the next thing you know, we'd be thinking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego all again. Because that scroll would have just sat in that fire and it would have burned, but it would have never burned up. It would have been like Moses looking at the burning bush. It would have burned but not been consumed. And God would have protected his writings, Jeremiah's writings, and the words that he spoke if he didn't want them to be destroyed. What does he tell Jeremiah? Do? Look, just write them all again. And, and not only those, add some to it this time. Let's really mess them up. So he comes along and he puts this together. And he's going to preserve his word. Clearly, God uh, expected uh, to be able to preserve his word. And what would a Bible believer do today? We could just believe the same thing about God's word that he does, and we could, we could move forward. Come to Psalm chapter 119. Psalm chapter 119. Psalm chapter 119 and verse 89. I love this. Such simplicity doesn't take a whole lot of verses to say what needs to be said. Psalm 119 verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And that's a good thing. It doesn't mean we can't find it here on earth. It means because it is settled in heaven, we can get an accurate, reliable, uh, 100% trustworthy copy of God's Word, which was settled in heaven and preserved right here on the earth. So in your study of manuscript evidence, you have been studying manuscript evidence, haven't you? You know, that's, you, you know the thing that just will open your eyes to this issue is the study of manuscript evidence because that's where your eyes will truly be opened. Through the study of manuscript evidence, we find that what appears to be such an overwhelming task, what appears to be something which is so, so vast and so big, and we say, how could we ever get our minds around this? How could we ever identify what's going on? But actually, it's pretty simple because all manuscripts or all Bibles on the market today come from one of two sources. One, the old King James Bible comes from the majority manuscript, which simply means that of all the manuscripts that are available today, approximately 95% of them agree with the old KJV. Why do they agree with the old KJV? Because the old KJV was translated from them. And the rest of the Bibles today, primarily, come from the minority manuscripts. And the minority manuscripts, which only represents maybe about 5%, there might be four or five manuscripts of which are pulled from, but primarily they come from two sources. They come from Codex Vaticanus and Three guesses of where, who's been in charge of that one for all these years. You know, they had it for some 1,400 years covered up in a glass in a room that the, the Bible students and the, and the textual critics of the day couldn't even have access to it. And so it was there. And then we have Codex Sinaiticus. And that was a, a, a manuscript which was found in the foothills of Mount Sinai at St. Catherine's Monastery. And, and a guy named Constantine uh, Tischendorf, he comes along and he finds it, thinking it's a great find. But the evidence was the monks that were there had to predetermine that it was corrupt and they were trying to get rid of it. Now, the two greatest sources that the minority manuscripts are representative of in all their Bibles, you know how many times they disagree one with the other? 3,000 times alone just in the Gospels. And you know what the, the, the monks at the St. Catherine's Monastery realized? Well, you can't trust this one, and we're going to put it in the garbage, and we're going to burn it, and we're going to get rid of it. And Tischendorf found it and uh, the confusion that he's brought amongst Christianity today. 
So the majority manuscript is so-called because of the majority manuscripts. And the minority is the same, the minority of manuscripts. So today in the marketplace, when you try to go find a new Bible and you walk into a, a Christian bookstore to buy a new Bible, we will see that there are literally hundreds of Bibles to choose from. So how do we know which one to choose? And what we do is we choose the Bible, which is represented by the, by the multiplicity of copies that God has chose to demonstrate and to be a part of his preservation process, and we choose that Bible. Now, up until the, the, uh, the publishing of the New King James Bible, it was a little easier. But it gets a little bit more difficult today because of, because of that. But I would say that what we need to do is if you are questioning whether or not you should or should not get an old KJV or a new KJV, read the preface. The preface is going to come along and say that this Bible was translated from the majority manuscripts and is in agreement with them unless or until we have decided that we like the rendering of a minority text. And there are just thousands of examples where they opted for the minority reading rather than the majority witness. And it's that. And sometimes so very, very subtle as to what the differences would be. But we just need to be careful. And it doesn't make a person a bad person that because it doesn't make a bad person just if they use an NIV. It doesn't make people bad people because they uh, would use a New King James. I have people that I love dearly. They use New King James. I know people who have been saved out of good news for modern man. I say that's a testament to the power of the gospel. (laughs) But it's not a question of any of that. And I tell you, I've come to firmly believe and to understand that the issue is the issue of faith. Let, let Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And I'm okay with you if it takes time. Because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. But when someone looks at us and they look at us and they say, well, you just got, you have misguided faith in what you believe about the preservation of God's word. I say, well, I, I don't believe that to be true because we have faith in a system that we learned directly from God that we got out of the majority text that taught us exactly how God not only inspired His Word, but how He put forth this program and the system of preservation. And God does not give us uh, and calls us to have to respond on blind faith. It's faith in what we can prove from and learn from what God has said that He was going to do. That's different. That's different than just saying, I believe it because somebody said it. I believe it because God said it and then he proved it to me in, uh, in his word. So we come along and we recognize and we're going to run out of time. But as we take the differences in the study between the minority manuscripts and the uh, majority manuscripts, if you do a careful con- a comparison between what the majority says about the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ You will not find the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ preserved in the minority manuscripts as you do in the majority manuscripts. Pastor George mentioned one. Can you imagine claiming that Joseph was the father of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's not benign. That's cause to misdirect the way you want to go. Joseph was perhaps the daddy, but the father was the Holy Spirit. And so we come along and we look at that. And how important is it that we recognize the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins? Compare the minority manuscripts and often what you'll come up with, in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. What's missing? The blood. Why would that happen? And it's not a translation issue. The reason that happens is because it's missing from the minority manuscripts. It's just not there. So we opt for the 
majority witness, which exalts the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in every way, which exalts who he is, his character, and his nature. And today, there's really only one place that we can find all these things, to find a Bible which is representative of inspiration and preservation, and it comes from the majority text, and we can have a copy of it that we can trust and believe in every circumstance and details of our life. And that's the Old King James Bible. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much as we uh, go through these doctrines and to know that that, uh, that you were passionate about it and you were careful that we too would be able to clearly identify what your mind and what your understanding, what your desire was for us in uh, the identification of, uh, of where your word has been preserved. We thank you for that. And we just pray and say as we go forward that we will represent about your word what you believe. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.